Hi everyone, my name is Will Carter and I'm the CTO of XX Labs. We are the Cayman Islands based developer of the XX Network. And as quick background, the XX Network is a full stack blockchain platform and it features a scalable quantum ready consensus protocol combined with what is arguably uh, the most private communications network in the world. And we are officially excited to announce the launch of our mainnet last month. Uh, we're still kind of recovering from the sleepless nights leading up to it, but you can check it out at xx.network. Now, I'm going to be talking to you from Cayman Islands today, but joining me will be David Chom, who's in Los Angeles. Um, and we're going to kind of do this in a fireside chat format where I'll ask some questions and David will um, share his thoughts. So by way of introduction, David Chom is the founder of the XX Network, and he's also widely recognized as the inventor of digital cash and also is widely known for his fundamental innovations in cryptography, particularly um, in regards to privacy technology, but also uh, with digital currency and even secure electronic uh, verifiable election and voting systems. Now, his ideas in cryptography innovations are found uh, throughout our space um, and in many cryptocurrencies, uh, but they're also found in, say, privacy networks like VPNs um, and even uh, onion routing based platforms such as Tor. And we're going to touch on all that in a little bit, but given the decentralization theme of the Blockdown Conference, uh, I wanted to give David the chance to share his views on what it is we in this space are working towards and how we might achieve it. So let me jump right in with a very simple baseline question. Uh, David, can you tell us what you think uh, decentralization is or what it means and why do you consider it so important? First off, I wanted to thank Carolyn Garcia and Aaron Kor Haliller uh, at Blockdown for inviting me to speak today at DData. I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts uh, and insights regarding decentralization, why it's important, what really needs to be done to properly implement a truly decentralized network. Uh, to answer your question, Will, I guess one way to explain decentralization is as the opposite of centralization. And by that, I just mean the uh, you know, central control of societal rules and economic activity and information that we're all uh, familiar with. The idea is that everyone should be able to participate in generating economic upside and also uh, political and uh, in their political and personal life without interference. Yeah, and centralized control of infrastructure is obviously not something new. But as you predicted in the early 80s and early 90s, digital communication in particular, and eventually the internet and web 2.0, has in a lot of ways really increased the centralized control uh, over some of the most critical infrastructure we use as individuals on a daily basis, such as banking, messaging, social media, um, et cetera. And so the obvious follow-up question is, how big of a problem uh, is centralized control really? Well, we all know there's a problem with decentralized control of things, but I think it's important periodically to say it out loud. It's undisputed that generally, when all the power is centralized, the rest of us suffer. Now, in the last century, there's been an awful lot of uh, egregious uh, abuse. And uh, so, for example, uh, here's a simple graph from the United Nations that shows the kind of things that happened. Uh, they found, not surprisingly, that's Depending on education and healthcare, for instance, goes down as centralization increases. Put simply, power corrupts. Centralization results in a small number of people having all the money and influence which they typically use to further their own interests. It's anti-democratic. Democracy is about decentralization and about the people holding the power. Look at just a few familiar real-world examples. Uh, centralization uh, 
ex uh, has exploited information by Facebook, for instance, or information that they take and make money off of, and we get nothing but uh, abuse. And the, 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 you know, the huge amounts of money that are made by investment banks, for instance, that control centralized, that doesn't control centralized markets. I mean, this is a huge tax of several percent on the global economy. And, uh, uh, you know, these are just examples, but uh, in, the, in the economic sphere, but there's also all kinds of bad things that happen with respect to individual rights, taking away people's rights to be who they want to be, read what they want, travel where they want, say what they believe, etc. Now, how did you as a cryptographer really come to identify and become concerned about the threat of centralization uh, and, and really recognize the societal problems that it creates? Well, my studies have been in computer science uh, because cryptography in the modern era has been about the implementing and controlling uh, data and secure computing systems. So in effect, cryptography is now part of computer science. In the old days, before computer networks, say World War II, secret codes, which was early cryptography, uh, was about engineering and math for securing communication. Once you understand the speed of replicating digital software and hardware and the modularity of computer systems, you realize how fast something digital can grow. As the ARPANET was implemented during the 70s, the original four universities, uh, this was the original network that became the internet, if you squinted hard, you could imagine a huge network of computers with access by most people. I thought a lot about this when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, as did some others. We tried to imagine what was likely to happen as global digital networks became widely adopted. There was one group, including, well, for one person, Bill Joy, who went on to create the first open source Unix code called BSD. That was actually in the same department that I was in under Bob Fabry. And um, he also co-founded some microsystems. And uh, my office mate, Eric Schmidt, was also involved in this uh, and the creator of Java. Well, Bill was concerned about centralized entities, corporations and governments controlling all the code and has been a force in the open source movement and later spoke out about you know, other technology dangers uh, from centralization. I was focused on central control of data and information in terms of privacy for people and its role in democracy. You could say it was all a bit of science fiction because at that time, you know, we maybe were 15 years away from real adoption of the World Wide Web. But at that time, the National Security Agency threatened the full force of the US government against anyone who would even have cryptography as a topic for a session at an academic conference, let alone a whole conference on it. So recognizing the importance of cryptography for the future of humanity, I risked it all and secretly organized an international conference on cryptography in Santa Barbara. This launched the International Association for Cryptologic Research, which is the main organization to this day, which sponsors the three meetings every year and a, a, a flagship meetings and a half a dozen other events and, and publish a journal and so forth and so on. Uh, I also organized uh, back in early days, a summer school on cryptography where it turns out most of the key players in the field were either students or invited lecturers. By then, many of us understood that crypto and digital signatures would be critical in putting control in the hands of people. You can see that today with Bitcoin. It's your digital signature that controls your Bitcoin, not some intermediary like a bank or a central bank. During that time in the 80s, say, I published a number of papers that defined likely key problems and proposed possible cryptographic solutions to address challenges I saw coming with the emerging digital network. Now on that note, apart from voting anonymity in digital currency, 
You did a lot of early work on the notion of giving uh, control of information to distributed groups of computers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your specification of what I think was the first blockchain in your PhD dissertation at Berkeley um, back in 1982? Sure, Will. Uh, it's true that my dissertation at Berkeley, which was uh, placed in the library but never actually published because I didn't want to give the copyright out, uh, but it was publicly available in the library and people had checked it out, uh, actually gave a specification in a programming language called Settle of a network of untrusted computers that would use crypto to check and confirm data records which they stored. I called it a network of vaults. The idea was to design a system where mutually suspicious groups could work together to perform a computation where each contributed secret information and could be sure that the computation was done correctly, the secret information wouldn't leak, but the results, even if some of them were confidential, would be delivered to the correct parties uh, on an ongoing basis. And of course, uh, other third parties couldn't come in and manipulate uh, the process. So the, the, my dissertation at Berkeley was titled Computer Systems Established, Maintained, and Trusted by mutually suspicious groups. Uh, what I did was to take, you know, the sort of two-party secure communication concept that dominated cryptography and extend it to multiple computers that communicate. Uh, checking and verifying uh, transmissions and, 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 and agreed data to be stored uh, at each step. It was actually a blockchain. Yeah, and you guys actually were able to specify this in code and run it on a network, right? Yes, that's true. The vault system was codified in a, a language, as I mentioned, Settle, that could be implemented based on uh, all the code, which was in the dissertation as a specification. It, it was a, a, a real, live, living, breathing blockchain. Uh, we even tried to get it running when I was uh, teaching at NYU. Yeah, those were, of course, early days, uh, even before the internet. So could you help us understand some of the milestones that really mark the progress as work has been done to actually implement blockchain technology widely, um, say with Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or, or any other cryptocurrency? Well, over the last few years, and I noticed again this past summer, there's been a lot of attention paid to the key pieces and breakthroughs that underpin Bitcoin in particular. It's worth Googling Bitcoin history if you're interested. There's a lot of, if you're not familiar with it, there's a lot of good material out there and pretty interesting and understandable. Uh, as far as my contribution beyond blockchain consensus, there's a whole trajectory in my work around blind signatures that led to digital or electronic cash. Uh, the work and my founding of DigiCash and the introduction of digital cash, which was used by major banks around the world, is why people generally give me credit for inventing electronic cash, numbers that are worth money. So signatures enabling control of user money based on my work and what we implemented at DigiCash uh, are used heavily in, in cryptocurrencies. It's in a sense the basis for cryptocurrencies uh, I think you mentioned that, but uh, the focus today is on the operation of the centralized network and the mechanisms for adding computers or nodes to the network and how the computers decide and agree on what's correct and valid data record. Uh, this is called reaching consensus. Bitcoin addressed consensus based on proof of work, the basic concept for which was actually introduced to create uh, a cost for email spamming, and it was published by, uh, presented at, at one of the uh, ICR-sponsored conferences in Santa Barbara by Cynthia Dwork and Moni Noor, one of my co-authors in 1993, and then later adapted by Adam Back in 97 for the likes of Bitcoin. As uh, most people know, the problem with proof of work is efficiency and cost and energy wasting. And these issues really became obvious uh, when Ethereum introduced uh, usable smart contracts based on my old colleague uh, Nick Zombo's writing. In fact, you know, Nick worked at DigiCash in Amsterdam back in the day. 
Now, Bitcoin is obviously a huge success as both a store of value and even as a digital financial asset. And Ethereum has really managed to introduce distributed com computations generally to the world uh, in the form of smart contracts. But both of these platforms came fairly early and you might say that they've been limited in the ability for their scalable use um, by their proof of work consensus protocol. Um, and so use cases like, let's say, worldwide efficient payment processing or uh, affordable decentralized trading or even just generally performance smart contracts have really been hard to achieve without additional layer two solutions, which of course introduces um, complexities and even new security assumptions. And I think this is why, say, Ethereum has been working for years on a more efficient uh, Ethereum 2.0 that moves a little bit away from proof of work and more towards the, the proof of stake approach. So with all this in mind, can you share with us your own thoughts on these problems uh, in terms of the ability for this technology to go to mainstream and solve mainstream problems and achieve mainstream scale? Um, and what do you think is the way forward? Well, before I get into the details and share a video I have, which explains the XX approach to consensus, I want to explain two things that I think are critical to having an efficient layer one, so-called solution that supports high performance, affordable smart contracts, uh, smart track or computing uh, while doing it securely and privately. Uh, the first is the idea of anonymity uh, that most people don't think of it as providing more than privacy, but actually anonymity can provide security. And this is the approach which we use at XX, and it's grounded in the notion of, let's say, hiding in a crowd as a way of protecting against attack. The idea that uh, they can't attack you if they can't find you or don't know who you are or where you are. So Jason Bourne in the Bourne movies is uh, always using this approach. When they try to hunt him down and take him out, he's always running into a huge crowd in a town square or a train station or something and they can't find him and he escapes. The anonymity approach is fundamentally different from the notion of fortifying yourself where you don't attempt to hide because attackers know where you are. You just build some sort of impenetrable uh, hopefully uh, protection like a castle in the Lord of the Rings with uh, huge walls to hide behind. Or you can invent some sort of protection like the Iron Man suit. But to exploit the hiding in a crowd approach, you need an anonymous private communication layer so that you or a node cannot be identified while, while communicating with other computers. We have implemented this at XX Network with a very fast mix called C-Mix. Okay, actually I, I published mixing as my master's thesis at the end of the 70s at Berkeley, but only recently is the delay caused by these privacy networks been reduced by the C-Mix breakthrough so that it's acceptable for messaging and transactions. Weirdly, this functionality allows XX Network to support private messaging like in the XX Messenger while also supporting secure, efficient, distributed, even multi-party computing, which we call super smart contracts. We create teams of computers to run software and process batches, but they don't know who each other are because they communicate and work together by communicating through CMIX. It's like they're hiding in a busy town square with thousands of people working together without knowing who they're cooperating with. Yeah, and can you tell us a little bit about how CMIX works and how it provides anonymity? I did a short video that explains how CMIX works and how teams are randomly selected. Uh, why don't we just play that? 
message content can easily be protected by so-called end-to-end encryption. But this does not protect the information about who is talking to whom and when. The metadata, which is increasingly recognized as far more revealing and more challenging to protect. Each member of a team of nodes, in order to protect the metadata, successively shuffles the batch of encrypted messages using its container of secretly arranged tubes and sending the messages without delay through to the next team member. Even just a single node can keep senders from being linked to recipients. Alice also gets a receipt informing her confidentially that her message was provided to Bob. Team members then destroy their secret pattern of tubes, making way for a new team ready for a new batch. Right, and you used the phrase hiding in a crowd before. Uh, please give us a little bit more context about how CMIX in the XX network actually implements this idea. Sure. Uh, CMIX uses a so-called anonymity set, which is the crowd that messages, data, instructions hide in. We have an anonymity set of about a thousand indistinguishable pieces of data. Uh, these can actually be messages or transactions or instructions or what have you. Uh, so each second, or it'll be more frequent with um, more traffic on the network because it scales linearly just by adding in more teams. So each input is mixed with uh, say 99 other inputs that appear to be exactly the same. And that's why you can't identify a specific input message or track it to a corresponding output message. It's uh, kind of like the meme which went around for a, a bit on social media with Nicolas Cage. Uh, here's a picture. Imagine that there's one Nicolas Cage that's real and all the others are fake. It's not easy to find the real one. Yeah, and I personally love this idea that anonymity, which is generally about providing privacy, could actually be leveraged to provide, say, additional security um, for certain types of transactions. Now, speaking of security, um, another popular topic that is becoming more popular by the day, it seems, is quantum computing, and in particular, the effect that it's going to have or might have on existing blockchains and even traditional infrastructure. So can you share uh, some of your thoughts on quantum computing? Yes, there is a definite need for quantum resistance signatures. It is a fact that quantum computers of adequate size could be used to take down any existing blockchain. The reason is because these chains use legacy crypto, which is breakable by quantum computers. Attackers could, uh, for instance, uh, selectively empty certain wallets. Once an attacker breaks the signatures that currently allow coin holders to verify their ownership, prove their ownership of a, of a wallet, uh, especially after the public key is revealed in an earlier transfer, the attacker can pose indistinguishably as the true owner and move the coins wherever. But also attackers could simply wreak havoc by destroying consensus. Few at this point would maintain that such quantum computers are very unlikely in the next five years. But many realistically think that they are very possibly just a few years out. In fact, they might even already exist in secret government laboratories. The exact timing depends on breakthroughs that may surprise everyone or the steady progress of some of the major projects that are already underway. Everyone agrees that the question is not if, but when. So here's a couple of news articles that show that there's a, you know, a lot of momentum in this uh, space these days. There's a major technology companies, national laboratories, a lot of money's pouring into startups. Here's a couple of uh, not mutually exclusive scenarios that are likely for the emergence of quantum computers uh, that would be capable of breaking today's uh, blockchain cryptography. Uh, one scenario is that a, a lab makes a breakthrough or is well-funded enough to get there before everyone else, they would be in a position to steal a lot of money and also to spy on a lot of people, but they would have a tremendous incentive to keep this quiet. If they're not a government agency, they might likely be approached and co-opted by one. A second scenario is that some breakthrough or progress is published and all of a sudden the blockchain community gets spooked and panicked 
and wants to urgently secure their assets. Yeah, I would agree. I think quantum computing is a very real threat. And we here in the blockchain crypto community uh, need to take it very seriously in particular, uh, not only because of the sheer amount of value that's stored in blockchain networks, uh, but also because we don't have a lot of the uh, centralized recovery benefits that um, say banks have, for example. You know, if I lose access to my Bank of America account, um, I can generally call someone, get them on the phone, uh, they can reset my password, they can check my identity. Um, so they, they, can, they can generally be a bit more reactive um, with that centralized control than say a decentralized network. So now is the time to start thinking about ways that we can prevent quantum computing from creating problems in the first place. Um, so you saw it coming. What do you think is the best way to address the quantum computing challenge? We've designed, as you know, Will, a platform and currency that will last for decades by designing a novel approach to using the strongest quantum resistant cryptography. This allows us to withstand the threat that rapid development of quantum computing poses to current cryptography. We've built our infrastructure from the ground up to be fast and easy to use while still using the full out brute force strength that of quantum secure uh, cryptography, the strongest that's available and probably that ever will be. This is as good as it's gonna get. And we, we have sort of a two stage approach. So the first stage is already operational. We have backup protection that is compatible, in fact, with all kinds of uh, wallets uh, and signatures that are out there. We develop a new way to embed a quantum secure public key within a typical cryptographic key used to secure blockchains today. And this means we can temporarily use non-quantum signatures for our transactions, which makes it easy to adopt existing key management tools and wallets like Ledger and MetaMask and so on. Uh, the technology received a lot of interest when we fully specified it and published it in cooperation with a researcher uh, from Cardano in a, in a peer-reviewed uh, place. So um, it's, we're, it's already deployed for our, our wallets on, on, our, on the XX uh, uh, network. And uh, in the second stage, we've uh, developed the first linearly scalable consensus that uses this new efficient form of ultra-secure hash-based quantum resistance signature. It protects the network from uh, quantum computing while still letting uh, XX grow to thousands of nodes and still process thousands of transactions a second. We've, you know, we've demonstrated this and we're, uh, we're planning to transition from stage one to stage two. Uh, essentially, we've decided to take the time to rewrite the core technology and that should be doable within, well, certainly within a year, if not considerably sooner. Then all wallet owners can use that embedded quantum secure public key that's hidden in their wallet uh, for, from in stage one to prove their ownership of the wallet and move to the new signature scheme in stage two. Because other quantum secure cryptography is generally way more cumbersome and expensive than cryptography that's standardized by governments today, which is what all blockchains use, our uniquely scalable consensus will remain fast and performant while other major platforms are unfortunately likely, we believe, to suffer a large performance hit if they were to try to retrofit quantum secure cryptography. Right, and so by using this two-phase approach, we can really get out the door a bit quicker, providing the ability to fall back to quantum secure transactions on demand, while also allowing us to integrate to more efficient quantum secure cryptography, um, both at the consensus layer, but also for wallets um, and even messaging. And this messaging aspect is something that's extremely important and not really talked about a lot. Um, but, you know, traditionally when you send a message over Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram, um, the message is encrypted, but it's generally encrypted with non-quantum secure cryptography. And so this is happening now. There are groups who are gathering encrypted data, they're gathering encrypted messages with the goal of eventually using a quantum, uh, quantum computer to decrypt it. And so people need to take into account that the data or messages that they're sending today 
uh, will eventually be decrypted, either by a government, by a corporation, or even by malicious individuals. Um, and this is why we've developed quantum secure messaging into our network um, as part of that layer two uh, communications protocol. So moving back to the blockchain itself, what do you see as the best way to address uh, the quantum computing challenge? Yeah, so the way forward is using a new approach to consensus. It allows an essentially unlimited number of new member nodes to join a network while still keeping things efficient and secure. The network has to reach agreement on each successive data record, which together make up the ledger or the blockchain. The best way to address this challenge is with some sort of nominated proof of stake. Generally speaking, this is the approach of the newer generation of blockchains like Polkadot, for that matter, and Ethereum 2.0. We use elements of the nom nominated proof of stake approach, but with a number of distinctive features built into the protocol, two of which sec uh, security through anonymity and quantum secure signatures we've discussed. Let me just go ahead and share a video we've put together that explains how excess consensus protocol works and how it achieves this tremendous uh, uh, scalability linear um, and, and speed up, uh, it's about seven minutes long. In this video, you'll be introduced to XX Network Consensus. It has already demonstrated thousands of quantum resistance secure payments per second, even as the network grows to include many thousands of nodes. Blockchains are cryptographically chained together in such a way that nothing about them can be altered. The servers or nodes that comprise a blockchain system need to agree or what's called reach consensus on each new block before it can be added as the next block. There must be agreement on the exact same block to add onto the end of the sequence or blockchain, even if some nodes are malfunctioning and or actively trying to subvert the network. For instance, such nodes could try to get two different blocks added, each by different parts of the network. Here's a fun fact. So-called Byzantine nodes are nodes that are hell-bent on creating disruption or division. Systems that can resist them are called Byzantine Fault Tolerant, or BFT. A BFT system can move things forward correctly no matter what the Byzantine nodes might try to do, so long as no more than one-third of the nodes are Byzantine. The first theorists to write up the idea did it through an allegory of generals in the age of Byzantium trying to agree on when to invade a city. The root of the general's problem was that they couldn't trust their messengers to deliver correct messages reliably. This first write-up kicked off the now substantial technical literature on distributed networks. Suppose three friends, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, are trying to decide between having burgers or pizza for dinner. You might think that a simple majority vote is enough to decide. However, let's look at a scenario where Alice votes for pizza and Bob votes for burgers. But Charlie is duplicitous in telling Alice that pizza's the way to go, while at the same time telling Bob that burgers are the best option. Now, Alice believes pizza got two-thirds majority, while Bob believes burgers got two-thirds majority. Charlie has gone Byzantine causing twice as much food to be purchased and so doubling the spending. For blockchains, when a new block is added, it records a batch of transactions. The most common example, and that is here, is of digitally signed transactions, each authorizing value to be moved from an account for which the respective signature type is on record on chain. In order to better understand XX network consensus, let's look at the different roles the nodes in the system can take on for the purpose of adding the next block. The block producer, or BP for short, is a single node selected from all nodes unmanipulatably at random. The role of the BP is to propose a single new block that should include all new valid transactions. What are called endorser nodes are selected for this block unmanipulatably at random from all nodes, but the number of endorsers is always the same. 
The role of the endorser nodes is to certify the new block proposed by the BP. The XX solution lets every functioning node in the network participate in the consensus protocol without it having to make a heavy lift. And in this role, a node is called a validator. XX consensus only uses intensive communication between a limited number of nodes, just the endorsers. This means that even if the number of validators grows dramatically, the time it takes to reach consensus grows only slightly. Because the most time-consuming part of adding a block, by far, is the communication within the fixed size set of endorsers. Before proposing its new block, the BP checks validity for all transactions that should go into it. Each transaction must pass two tests. The first checks validity of the authorizing signature for the account that value is moved from, and the second checks that enough value was in that account to cover the transfer. The BP can discard any invalid transactions encountered and should combine all the valid ones into the new block. Next, the BP sends out its proposed block as a tag. Such a tag cryptographically defines the exact block, but is very compact. Validators receiving the tag directly or indirectly from the BP should check that the BP was in fact the one chosen cryptographically, but unpredictably. When most validators tell the endorser subset that they agree with the tag, it means that they've seen the same tag and hence agree on the exact same next block to add. At this point, the endorser should have completed double checking all the tests the BP should have made and they can sign off. This then ensures the two key properties. First, that exactly one block is added, since almost all validators saw the same tag defining the block from the unique valid BP. This means, for instance, that Byzantine nodes have failed to split or stop the network. Second, that most endorsers have verified that the block is fully valid, and thus, for instance, Byzantine nodes have failed to insert false transactions. In short, we guarantee that there is always exactly one version of the blockchain and the values it records for each account are correct. The validators can now move on to the next new block to add with its new unmanipulatable random endorser set and choice of BP. The XX network consensus protocol uses cryptography that is quantum resistant. In fact, it uses the strongest type of quantum resistant cryptography and proven protocols assuming only the minimum needed for security. So developments in the quantum computing space will not threaten the value stored by users of XX network. And since the number of endorsers is always the same, performance of the network is essentially unchanged no matter how many nodes join. Yeah, so the core idea is that there's a smaller group of endorsing computers or nodes who run the heavy lifting portion of the consensus protocol. And the obvious concern, you know, someone might have is that you've sacrificed some decentralization with this approach and uh, in some ways made the network less secure. Um, and do you believe that this is the case with our network? Well, no, actually it isn't uh, too much of a good thing. You must have a smaller subgroup to be efficient enough because of the uh, bandwidth requirements that grow quadratically with the number of of nodes in this set. So we use a constant group size, irrespective of how many nodes join the network. But by randomizing its membership at each block, we keep in an unmanipulatable way, we keep a very high level of security. Uh, I should also like to mention that we use a breakthrough compact endorsement signature too, that uh, rather than uh, pairs of nodes sharing full signatures, uh, we developed a way for nodes to have just pieces of the overall signature, which when shared can become a full strength quantum secure signature. This dramatically reduces the computing and communicating re communication required to reach consensus for each block, even allowing smartphones to fully verify 
their transactions. And this is why excess consensus can be low cost and fast, even while supporting a large diverse network with fully scalable smart contracts and private messaging. As far as I understand, no other chain really has this linear scalability. We could add more and more processing without slowing the consensus down appreciably. In order to prevent attackers from controlling uh, the small endorser group, you can and must have a larger group of computers to select from, which we do. So currently we have about 600 nodes across our mainnet and canary net. Uh, these are each operated by individuals. This is a, quite a, a special thing, and we have quite a number of dedicated uh, followers that really, you know, uh, community members that really care about what we're doing and, and uh, are worthy of, I think, more trust than uh, your, your random uh, node. And uh, the more decentralized nodes and the more geographically dispersed, of course, as far as, especially in terms of jurisdictions, the better. So we've really focused on that. And here's a picture that shows how widely distributed the XX nodes are. And we expect to go to thousands of nodes as we add dApps uh, to the network. A large group of nodes and then a smaller endorser group that is randomly and unmanipulatably selected, it's the best of both worlds. To document the performance of XX consensus as network size grows, I wanted to share a clip from a YouTube live event we did. It's a technical review of XX consensus testing with our nodes community. Uh, lead engineers Bernie Cardosa and Baltazar Arozo go over the results. Bernie points out that the time to finality for XX consensus, the time to reach consensus, including validating an update to the blockchain, is pretty much unchanged as the network grows from 200 to 1,000 nodes, with a 1,000 node network at 300 transactions per sec, 3,000 transactions per second. Processing to finality only took three seconds. In fact, these nodes were very small. Uh, slow computers that were limited to 100 megabits up and down link and uh, using conventional disk drives and so on. So if we can get, achieve that kind of performance with these limited nodes, uh, we're, we're uh, looking forward to even perhaps uh, better performance as we move to, to real server class nodes. Hello, everyone. So the first graph we want to show you is finality versus network size. So as you can see, mostly finality is remaining near constant as the network size increases so you can see we're increasing from 200 to 1000 nodes and let's take a look at like the lowest dps 500 you can see it remains pretty stable under one second then once you increase the, the tps input so transactions per second are coming into the network obviously finality will increase but when you move from to more nodes you will actually see for example in 3k tps you see the network performing better with more nodes than with less. All right, so a while ago, we mentioned smart contracts, which have been sort of a killer app for crypto uh, and specifically for Ethereum, um, but we've not really discussed them that much here today. Can you explain how the XX architecture with smaller randomly selected groups um, can leverage that approach uh, specifically to distributed computing or smart contracts? Smart contract computing is about a group of computers working together to execute a software program, but doing it in a way that is secure or protected such that the various participants are required to correctly execute the program. It's a form of what I've called multi-party computing. We actually are doing a, a special case of multi-party computing right now on XX Network. We've talked about the way we randomly select small groups of computers or nodes to check each block and reach consensus. We use the same sort of structure to run CMIX, which remember is the privacy protected communication layer of the XX network. A small team, in this case like five nodes, is selected randomly to create a, C a CMIX uh, a team, which we uh, involved in what we call a pre-computation that they prepare to process a batch of messages very quickly. And then when they're uh, one second or whenever, when their actual time to operate 
comes up, the thousand messages can arrive and they can process them uh, extremely efficiently because all the cryptographic heavy lifting has been done in advance. So uh, with this provides what we call an enemy set of a uh, thousand pieces of data, as I mentioned, and um, we checks that you know the nodes do this all correctly. And you know, in some sense, you could say this is effectively a multi-party computation of, of mixing. Mixing is the computation and it's run by a team of nodes in our current live network. Um, and our implementation of smart contract computing that we're working on is essentially another instance of this kind of way to spread the effort over a, a randomly selected but fixed size set uh, of nodes. So the idea of a multi-party computation is, uh, you know, the, the paper that had that uh, coined the phrase is why well, I was a primary author on it and that we won the best of the stock theory conference uh, award for the last 30 year, uh, best paper of the last 30 years in, in the stock conferences because it's a very fundamental result that was extremely uh, thrilling to be involved in, in moving the frontiers of uh, of knowledge, uh, science, uh, technology uh, forward in such a, a powerful way. I, I sort of liken it to the Maxwell's equations of uh, information security. Basically, what we showed is that if you have a bunch of honest uh, computers, that were, half of them are more honest, then they can simulate a computer that is completely trustworthy. Everyone can be certain that it does only the right thing and it never leaks any of the secret information that it has. So it may supply secret results to different people, it has cryptographic keys, it could use side things and so on, but it, it, it always does exactly the right thing and no matter any uh, collusion of, of less than a majority of the notes. So it's a, uh, a, a very big uh, uh, deal because it solves basically any information security problem. If you have a fully trusted entity, you can trust them with everything and it, that solves information security problems. Everyone just tells it their secrets and it tells everyone what they're supposed to know and it never lies, it does everything correctly. Everyone can be sure of that. So that solves any information security problem. So this is a big step up from, you know, so-called Turing complete uh, uh, smart contracts, which are just computations which are repeated by a bunch of uh, nodes, but everything's completely transparent. And just because there's a loop, you can call it Turing, Turing complete. So unlike maybe Bitcoin original smart contracts, but you know that's no big deal. I mean, it's nothing. It's not a multi-party computation. Believe me, that's the. It's a. You're talking about. It's a, it's a completely different thing. So uh, we're hoping to be able to, with our partners, develop multi-party computations that leverages the power of privacy technology to 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 realize this. And um, so. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely exciting. All right, well, I think that wraps it up for this evening. Uh, thank you again, David, for speaking and to the audience for listening um, and being a part of our talk. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank Blockdown for hosting the D-Data event and for having us. Uh, David, do you have any parting thoughts? Uh, I actually do. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to listen to Ed Snowden, who I have a great deal of respect for. And similarly, I hope people will attend Gavin Wood's talk. I understand that both are presenting here as well. Thanks much to everyone for participating today.